Hello and welcome to Pharma Television News Review here at the Sachs Conference in Basel in September 2016. On this show, I have Daniel Barton, who is the Director of Business Development at a company called Bioceptor. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Bioceptor has its origins in Australia, but today it's an incorporated company here in, uh, the, or in the UK. Um, so it's a British R&D based company. That's correct, yes. We've maintained services in, in Australia, but uh, we are essentially domiciled in the UK. Okay, okay, very good. Now, we'll come on to all that and, and sure. later on um, and the, the logic behind that. Now, the, you're a, I suppose you're a, an oncology focused company, would be that correct yes, to say correct. that? Um, I suppose one of the lead areas that you're working in is, is uh, NFP2K7. NFP2X7. NFP2X7. That's correct, yes. Um, and uh, could you tell us a little bit about why that is a, a suitable target? Absolutely. Uh, P2X7 is part of a, a family of receptors uh, that uh, exist as transmembrane pores. Um, P2X7 is the... Uh, all of them respond to ATP concentrations in the extracellular environment, which is a, a signal of the microtumor environment. P2X7 happens to have the, the lowest response, uh, the least affinity to, P2X, to, to ATP. What that means is it only responds in, becomes the ion channel uh, that it is in, in very high ATP concentrations. Uh, and that is, correlates with the microtumor environment. It's now well understood that ATP concentrations external to the cell uh, can be very, very high and uh, create a hostile environment inside tumors. Okay, so how does that then translate into a non-functional sure. um, P2X7? Yes, uh, well, that's... Um, or NF, the NF it's, it. it's actually quite interesting science. So the P2X7 channel is, uh, it responds to ATP in two ways. The first way is to form a selective cation channel, which means calcium signaling, which essentially leads to proliferation and survival advantage in cancer cells. Um, however, when functional P2X7 is operating, uh, there is a second function which uh, kicks in after persistent ATP stimulation, and that is the formation of a larger pore, which is non-specific. So large molecules can pass in and out of the cell. It's essentially a depolarization of the cell membrane, which is an apoptotic signal. So uh, initial response is proliferation, extended response is apoptotic. That's the functional form. Our thesis and what our target is all about is a variant on that P2X7 target where that second function fails to occur. So despite finding itself in a high ATP environment, the P2X7 uh, receptor won't initiate the apoptotic signal. It will continue to generate the proliferation signal. And our data shows that that function is actually conferring a survival advantage on cancer cells. So, the, the, how do you? So, what's the uh, therapeutic approach to this? How do you? How do you? What we've done is deal with this cl from a, in a clinical setting. Well, it's important that um, we distinguish in our therapies between P2X7 and non-functional P2X7. P2X7 has roles in in the immune system and in the neural system, so off-target effects could be quite drastic. What we've done is identify an epitope which is only exposed in the non-functional form. Uh, and we've been able to address that with a multiple antibodies as well as also a vaccine approach. And so where are you in that, in that story in terms of developing those antibodies and we, selecting a suitable therapeutic? Presumably? We've selected uh, two candidates for uh, systemic uh, phase one trials. So we have a monoclonal antibody uh, designated Bill O3S which we will be taking into the clinic uh, end of this year. Or it's a humanized. Fully, it's a fully human domain antibody uh, developed uh, in, in a partnership with Demantis, although we uh, retain all of the rights to that particular asset. Okay. And uh, in the, uh, um, actually just before we go any further, because you do have some interesting people on the board, like Greg Winter and so forth, so That's you've right. got some, some good, good credibility there. Um, th just before we go, on to uh, the clinical development program and, and your, 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 your strategy there. Um, it's interesting that you took a, a, an Australian company and then incorporated it or made it a domicile in the UK. Mm -hmm. What was the logic behind that? The logic there was uh, access to markets, also access to talent. Um, 
Greg Winter became familiar with our story at a conference in Australia. Uh, he he uh, talked to us about uh, the formation of the Science Advisory Board, offered that he would be happy to chair that, um, and we were very pleased with that. Uh, his, his advice was that, that Cambridge is a, a real centre for expertise in antibody yeah. um, exp uh, expertise, as well as just generally in uh, bio biology discovery. Um, and so that's uh, been, that, that lab was set up about two years ago and we've um, divided the company's uh, focus, the two, two um, locations. In, in um, Cambridge, we, what we focus on is the biology, the mode of action, uh, uh, taking new approaches to understanding the target and the, the overall metabolism. Uh, what we do in Australia is we have a team of, on production development, so tech transfer, scale up, and we also have a discovery team uh, looking at next generation candidates. So you, you, you have the advantage of, uh, of both countries in terms of talent, but also potential things like tax credits and so That's forth. That's true. Uh, we've we've um, been um, qualified for the patent box um, designation in, in the UK, so we've got that advantage. But we continue to be able to avail the R&D tax rebate in Australia, which is 45%, uh, which is actual dollars back in uh, at the end of the year, which is a huge advantage um, for investor right. um, value. And in, in terms of uh, financing of the business and so forth, where are you in that in that cycle? Historically, the company has uh, not had a formal round. Uh, we've been supported by originally family and friend, high net worth. It's fairly tightly held business. Um, we do have a, a, um, a, a register that has quite a number of shareholders now, although there are a, a, a small group who own a large percentage. Um, in the past year, what we've uh, done is begin our outreach for institutional investment. We're looking for partners, strategic partners, for validation partners, etc. So uh, that is uh, what the, the process we've been undertaking in the last year is to make begin that outreach. I've been part of that process. We've also uh, engaged Peel Hunt uh, Investment Bank in the UK to to run a, a formal Series A round in private uh, investment and. Uh, that is under. That is why I'm here today. Indeed, indeed. So let's just go back. So hopefully, get that money, and that will go well. Going back to the clinical development program. So you've got humanized antibodies, some mm -hmm. selected ones, or at least one of those mm -hmm. that you're going to take into the clinic. You've you've completed a preclinical. We have, yeah. Um, so the next step is into phase one. That's correct. Yeah. With a specific uh, view on which indication. We're actually going to have a basket approach. We see our right. target. Our target is. A, unique interest in the sense that we see it across 20 human cancer types um, via a variety of methods, IAC uh, binding to live cells. Um, so it's uh, what we've chosen is breast, colorectal and lung as the, um, the cohort that we'll be choosing from. What's uh, encouraging uh, about um, our physicians is our safety profile is, is quite acute. We've, uh, we've actually had all of our products in human and a significant other safety data. So our, our clinicians are uh, very eager to recruit. They anticipate very rapid recruitment. Okay. So what can we expect then over the next couple of years from Bioceptor? We expect to finish both of those trials, the systemic trials, in, um, in uh, 2017. So we expect some milestones in data beginning mid-2017. Um, we also are looking at our um, our third product, which I should talk about a little. It's actually our most advanced product. It, 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 the program was run as a proof of concept around the target uh, while we were still looking for a primary uh, uh, systemic candidates. And what we uh, chose to target with that product is um, uh, uh, non-melanoma skin cancers with a, a topical application um, and in fact we've run our phase one trial uh, successfully on that product. Uh, the FDA uh, found it interesting, it's a polyclonal formulation uh, which is, um, was the first of its kind, first antibody used uh, topically um, and we saw signal of efficacy, very good safety. What I think is interesting about that program is the cross-validation impact. So to generate that polyclonal uh, API, we uh, hyper-immunised a, a, a sheep flock for multiple months, producing a very strong titer for extended periods. An unusual extra set of safety data, but it also 
uh, created the potential, uh, our understanding that the vaccine pathway could also be uh, a valuable human therapeutic because the same peptide we use to vaccinate those sheep can be used uh, in humans right. as well. So you have a pipeline, you've got at least two products going through. Yeah. Into the, into the clinic, in the clinic, and into the clinic. Yes, that's right. We, yeah. we are seeking to fund the entire program, but we are, our discussions, we do appreciate that the complexity, the richness of that pipeline, especially the topical. Um, there are specialty dermas who like that idea, but don't like monoclonal for systemic and vice versa. So sure. those discussions are ongoing about how to best uh, take all of those products forward. Excellent. Well, Daniel, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you. Pharma Ventures, experts in deals and alliances.